Hi, everyone. It's Heather Sumlin with the With Winning in Mind podcast, along with Troy Basham. We would like to ask you to like and subscribe real quick so you don't miss anything we have coming up in the future. Today, we have Rusty Shriver. He is the U.S. national curling team for the Paralympic curling team. He's their coach. And so we're excited to talk to him today. We're going to learn all about how he found out about mental management, why he's a certified mental management coach, and kind of where he comes from. So, Rusty, let's get to know you better. How you doing? Thank you for having me, guys. I, uh, I'm kind of honored to uh, be part of your podcast. Thank you. We're so excited. Tell us a little bit about how you got into curling or maybe were you in any other sports before this? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll come out of this. Well, I tell you what, back in 1992, so that's slightly after I was born, but back in 1992, my wife and I moved to central Wisconsin, which is where we're both from. And our neighbors, as we were building our house, approached us and said, you got to curl. And my wife looked at him and said, absolutely not. She's not going to be involved in that game. She didn't even know what it was, but not going to be involved. Was it turned out over the next 20, 30 years? Uh, we went through playing the game and, and she was very, very good at herself. Uh, our kids came up through the ranks of juniors and that's a 21 and under category. And I uh, ended up uh, kind of starting in the high performance juniors with them. Uh, following that, back in 2008, I was asked to come aboard to assist with the, uh, the Paralympic team, and that was done by a great friend of mine that was the national coach at the time, and I came on, and, and uh, he left back in 2017, right before the 2018 games, and then at that point, I was put over to, uh, to become the national coach. So with that, uh, the sports that I do enjoy and that I have coached in the past is I think my favorite would probably, there's two. One would be fast pitch softball and absolutely love that sport, particularly in the developmental and the mid-level leagues uh, up through high school. And then trap shooting. Uh, uh, the family is American trap shooting uh, fans, but my son, he's a bunker trap shooter and uh, he's, he's taken that game to, uh, to a great level. And for that game, I, I can't even see the birds. So anyway, <laughs> my wife and I, we just watch as, as he catches them and, and makes them, turns them into dust. So that's kind of my background and where we've at. So I've been with the team now uh, as a national coach since 2008. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're moving it forward into the 2022 Paralympic Winter Games. Yeah, so where are they going to be again? The, the, the games are yeah. going to be in Beijing. Matter of fact, we head to Beijing here in just a couple of weeks. We, we leave the 13th of, uh, of October. And uh, we'll be going over uh, to compete at the Olympic site. Prior to any Olympics or Paralympics, they have just a, a whole variety of competitions come through and they're called training events for the sites. Wheelchair curling and the junior uh, world championships are traditionally the ones that are done for curling. So we'll be over at the Olympic Ice Cube in Beijing, which used to be the swimming center in Beijing. And uh, it's now been converted over to curling and, uh, and trying out their ice, which I, I hear is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that's a lot of ice to freeze. The swimming pool, let's just freeze it over, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is amazing. If you go on to YouTube, uh, there's a, a video of them transforming it from the swimming venue, really? switching it to the curling venue. And they can knock it. I believe that they can redo the surface in about 24 hours. I think it probably takes two to three days, is, is my guess, to totally convert it into playable. But uh, I can remember sitting with our team manager back in, must have been 2013 or so. We're sitting up in the stands at that point with swimming. And uh, and now you see the pictures, you can see the seats we're sitting in and now you're watching curling on one side. And I'm, I'm sure at the end where the diving boards are, that's where they've got the big marquees and such. So behind those marquees, I'm sure are still diving boards. So, uh, oh, it's, wow. it's pretty cool. Leave it up to Chinese to be so creative. That's, that's really oh, yeah. interesting. That's, that's exciting. That's exciting. Yeah. So you're yeah. obviously looking very forward to that. So we are. So how, how are we just before we dive into you a little bit more, how are we in the uh, Paralympic curling as a country? Are we, are we favored to win? Are we very competitive? Are we in development stage? Where are we and what should we be looking forward to next year? That's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, the U.S. Paralympic program has been totally re rebuilt since 2018. Um, it's an incredibly competitive environment as most of the athletes we have in the game from around the world. If you looked at the, the national teams that are out there and 12 of them will be in the Paralympic field, boy, oh boy, I would say that half to three quarters of competitors are the same competitors that were in that game when I entered in 2008. They may be playing different positions, but it's incredibly competitive. In 2018, following Pyeongchang, we turned our entire team over. 
We had one returning athlete is currently on the team. So we've been rebuilding the last four years uh, to get back to the Paralympics. Matter of fact, we ended up dropping out of the world championship. There's, there's a, uh, a qualification process of who actually plays in a world championship. It's only the top 12 teams in the world. And back in 2019 with our brand new team, we dropped out uh, at that world championship and had to play our way back into the world championship through an event that we had back in April, which is called the World B Championship. Um, in that event, um, we showed up well. I think the, tra- the team showed what they were made of and they actually won that event. So that gets them back in now to the World Championship. And we've got uh, to qualify now through the World Championship. We're down to about three teams that have yet to qualify um, or solidify their qualification and the U.S. is one of them. Currently we're 12th in a 12 team field. Uh, we could get bumped out to 13th, but we could rise ourselves probably up to probably about 10th. Again, where you fall into the field doesn't matter. You make it, you make it, now you play the game. So that's the long answer to your question. Mm-hmm. So where are we? We've been building. Our team right now is, is absolutely phenomenal, possibly and arguably the best team we've ever had. But they've got one more uh, event that they have to participate in starting the 21st of October. And that is the 20. 20- 21 World Chair Championship. So a favorable finish there, either beating Italy or coming in seventh or better will solidify our ticket into Beijing. Sweet. Awesome. Awesome. So now we got to watch. I'm optimistic. I think we'll do it. With- yeah, well, I, you know, th- this team is, is unbelievable. And we'll talk about them later as we go through the mental management application and we'll talk about them and their adherence to this. But uh, um, yeah, I've got all the confidence in the world in this team and, and so do they. So it all starts with leadership and who better to lead than Rusty. That's right. There we go. There we go. <laughs> That's I don't right. know about that. I've got, we've got a great staff. We've got an absolutely fantastic staff. And, and he's humble. And, and he's humble. Yes. I don't know about <laughs> that. But, but anyway, what it really comes down to is we had a team that after the 2018 rebuild, that they, they, they totally bought into the program. A uh, thorough, thorough evaluation of where we were, looked at our strengths. We looked at our weaknesses. We looked at what we had to work with. Uh, we went through the entire program. And, uh, you know, basically in the business, we considered a SWOT analysis. Well, we, we did that for our team. Uh, that's required actually by the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee in their, their quadrennial training plans. And, um, you know, we've, we lived by that plan and, and the team bought in. They truly did. And it's because of the, the members on the team that we're, is where we're at right now. They bought into the program and here we are today. They're doing very well. So I guess we should shift forward to, I'm sure most people are like, okay, how in the world does curling, just curling in general, right? Yeah. How, yeah. How, how big of a mental sport is that? I mean, you just, you just take the stone, you push it down the ice. How hard is that? I mean, how big of a mental game is that? So can you, <laughs> can you walk us a little bit as far as just, one, how, how much of the game is mental in your opinion? And then what do you do about it? Specifically, what do you do? And what does the Paralympic team do about addressing this issue? It, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. You know, it's, it's, you pick up the book with winning in mind, you start reading. I don't know if you have to get five or eight pages into the book, boy, and here's that 90% metal coming up. You, you have seminars, you have training events. Uh, yeah. You, you're, you're working with your athletes. You ask them, you know, what percent of, of our game or, or the people I work with the, uh, whether it be archers, trap shooters, uh, or even softball players, um, uh, what percent of your game is actually metal? And that number is going to always come back 85 to 95%. What it truly is, I can't tell you, but I can tell you what, the number is absolutely huge. And I think when you look at that 80 to 90, you're actually there. You know, everybody, well, most people after they've been trained to become a wheelchair curly, give them a year, give them a two, give them three, give them four, uh, depending upon how often they actually are training, um, they're going to get to the level where they can, they can uh, deliver stones down the ice slide them that 124 feet and get them to go where the, the skip, the, the tactician, the captain, whatever we want to call him, where they want him to go. You know, it, you and I could do that with enough practice, but to do that repetitively, particularly when the pressure starts rising up, which they'll take the world beach championship, which we, we, we just went through, which they did the year before and did very poorly. And I might add, um, it's absolutely huge. And, and you know, it really comes down to the fact that, that one, you know, you can do something based upon the time you've done. And you can convince yourself based upon your, your, the time that you've practiced that you're good at something. But 
that still doesn't guarantee you that when, when the pressure's on, when you're out there to make that shot in a world championship, it still doesn't guarantee you the fact that you're, you're going to even be in the neighborhood of where that stone's supposed to go. And that's where the metal part comes in. You know, we've always worked pr even prior to, to, to uh, jumping in with, with Lanny and y'all on the, uh, on the mental management concept. We've always preached the pre-shot routine, uh, which frankly was mainly physical. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've also, you know, talked about the, the uh, post shot review, which interestingly enough was, was different than we're working at now. The post shot review is what did you do wrong? You know, how are you going to correct it? Which is absolutely the wrong thing to be thinking about right after you made a mistake. And now you've made it twice. Yeah. And if you're mm -hmm. review and think about it again, now you've done it three times, four times, five times, six times. So it's, it's the, the, the mental aspect is huge. And, and then when we get into that little bit between the, 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 the way a, a, a shot will actually start will be the skip will will put his brush down on what and give you a target on what you're supposed to hit. And then you probably got 10 or 15 seconds before that stone actually starts moving forward. So what are you thinking about during that 15 seconds? You know, you may be thinking about mom and dad up in the stands. You may be thinking about the people that are watching on the web. You know, heck, you may be still thinking about the shots you either made or you missed on the last end. If you're not thinking about what you practice to think about, the odds of you making that shot are significantly decreased. No guarantee you're going to make it. Mm -hmm. But you definitely decrease the probability that you're going to effectively do what you are an anticipating to do again. So it, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. You know, the answer is all of those are going through yeah. my head during that 15 seconds for a lot of people. If you don't have yeah. a pre-planned determined thing you're going to think about, you're going to think about whatever the environment gives you. you so what, you yeah, bet. so you, you brought up with Winning in Mind. Obviously, that is the, the, the main book that uh, we have. It's not the best book. You know, Attainment, of course, is the best book. Wow. You know? Exactly. I was going to say that myself, but you beat me to it there, Troy. Yeah. Two reasons. It's half the size of uh, With Winning Mind, and I wrote it. So there you go. There's my <laughs> selfish you... plug for the so day. So the humility <laughs> only sticks with Rusty today. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I'm just kidding. Now, one of, the, the, one of the, the main purposes of that book is to lay the foundation of what mental management is. It, You know, we... Obviously, we're addressing the middle game. A lot of people address the middle game. There's all different, you know, directions you can come from it. He's coming, you know, Landy's coming from a performance view. But when you when you picked up the book and you read it, is there anything that stood out? Because I thought it was interesting. You mentioned earlier, well, you, yeah, I don't know if you, what, five, six, seven, eight pages in? So, obviously, something within that first chapter clicked for you. Yep. Do, do you know what that yep. is or was or what is it you think that – you know, people can really get just out of this book. You know, I, I think what it really comes down to is, is when you're looking at the book, I mean, if I remember right, going through that first chapter, I mean, we start to identify uh, what it actually means to win and, and winning may not necessarily be on the scoreboard. Um, uh, if you're brand new to a sport, take track shooting, for example, you're brand new to a sport and you're out there shooting a, uh, an event, um, the odds of you winning are, are slim to none. So you ask the question, why are you even bothering? And uh, it's bothering because you're, you're out there to compete and you've probably got a level of achievement, which you're going to consider a win. But you, it's maybe it's shooting 68 of a, out of 100. You've never shot 67 before and you're out there for 68. A 68 is a win. Well, yeah, great. You've lost the event by over 30 some odd birds. But no, you won the event. Uh, and then you can take a look at the, uh, the, 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 the concept of process versus outcome. And that's jumped in right there at the very beginning. Um, and that's, that's ultimately what we're all after in order to get very, very good at what we're going to do. We have to concentrate on the process, determine what our process truly is and allow the process to carry us to our, our end result of performance, whatever that happens to be. And then the, the, I think the biggest part that really comes to mind, and this is a key that I think is different from other concepts of of um, applied sports psychology. And again, I'll use the applied terms here. None of us are doctors, none of us are psychologists, but we are applying principles of psychology into coaching and, and moving our athletes forward. And that comes back to the whole thing that you guys are, are referring to as that self-image. And that's the piece. That's the piece that we had to rely on this last four years was, was self-image and change management. So that is, is truly when we, we started getting into that concept then the light went off. You know, that's different than I'd been coaching in the 
in the past. Um, again, we looked at confidence. We looked at preparation. We looked at uh, maybe it was a word difference. I don't know, but this whole concept of self-image really, really, really started to, to, uh, to determine that is probably going to be the key of what we as a team uh, need to do to move forward. And then as we go in and talk with particularly trap shooters, that, boy, oh boy, that, that's so key. You know, a trap shooter, or maybe this is even the same with you with rifle is, is these kids come off the range and, and you know, the <laughs> happens every time. How'd you do? I missed three for crying out loud. You missed three. You made 97 for crying out loud, but every single one of them, I missed, I missed, I missed. And, and, and that when we work with teams that particularly uh, trap teams, again, that's the first thing that we got to change with the coach, the staff and the parents is quit talking to the negative, talk about your accomplishments, not your failures. And, uh, Spectacular. So anyway, one chapter, it probably just took me longer to summarize what we picked out of one chapter than actually reading that chapter. But but that's really what got us interested and uh, and got me to pick up the phone and, and call on down to Texas. So how long ago was that that you read with Winning in Mind? Do you remember? I'm going or to how you that. found out about it even. Oh, that's that's wild. You know, I was I was at the time I was the associate coach of the team. So I'm going to go back. This had to be. I'm going to say 2013, 2014, somewhere right back in there. And um, we didn't have resources provided at the time for any type of sports psychology. Matter of fact, this is the first, well, I can probably tell you we're probably at the end of our two week period where we finally have got any type of, of uh, sports psychology uh, access to, uh, to true psychologists. So it's been a long time in the coming and it's really been a funding thing. Um, uh, and that's, that's a direct uh, correlation to the, the increased emphasis on Paralympic sports from the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. So they're doing a tremendous job uh, supporting our Paralympic athletes now. Um, but anyway, uh, so I went on the Internet, which, you know, I don't think it's a fad. I think that's going to stick around for a while. So anyway, um, went on the net and I just started looking at sports psychologist stuff. And somehow an article popped up and I bet you the article is probably from the American Rifle Inn. And I wouldn't be surprised if that went back into the 80s, 90s, 2000s, somewhere in that. It was an, it was an old, old article. And uh, it talked about Lanny and, and what he was doing as a shooter. And I'm pretty sure it was an American Rifle Inn. And uh, so then they had a name on there and I don't even know if the telephone number worked anymore. I don't remember, but it didn't take five minutes and do some Google searches and popped up and I ended up uh, calling down to the business and <laughs> answered the phone by Laddie. So we ended up talking on that several times and, and uh, trying to figure out a way that within our budget, we could make this whole concept work. And, um, you know, we, we had some good discussions, uh, I think at that point is when he actually referred the book to, to give it a read to see if it's anything we're interested in, which, which I did. And uh, several more phone calls. And uh, then the, the famous line, are you looking for information or transformation? I mean, <laughs> there you go. He dropped that one on me and we were definitely in transformation is what we were after. And, the, you know, at that point, um, we ended up putting a program together What he felt the best program was if we truly wanted transformation on the team that we had to have uh, the concepts ingrained within the team. And the best way to do that was to come down and train as a coach. So ultimately, uh, that's that's what I did. Came down. I got uh, I worked with you guys uh, and um, ended up becoming certified, if you will and uh, utilize that then within our team. So there's our transformation versus information and then carry that on out to, uh, to work at a higher level with, with uh, the folks up here uh, that have nothing to do with curling. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's one thing to, it's one thing to actually read the book and get the information, but then learning how to apply it to others within the sport that you're, you know, experienced with and knowledge on two totally different things. And that's always been, he's always been, we do a very good job as a society on providing information, but not as good on providing a transformation moving forward. And I like to look at it as, as in college. You know, you have two different forms. You have one that's more hands-on learning and one's more book learning. Yep. To me, information is book learning. Hands-on is more 
transformational. So I think that's a, the way dad looks at it too, looking at mm-hmm. that. So how, how has that changed your coaching style from that moment where you kind of went through this transformational mode and then going back? Because now there's two different coaches. There's Rusty before <laughs> and there's Rusty after. How has that helped you in your, in your coaching? And is there any, any particular thing that you think really elevated your, your game as a coach? That's a great question. That's a really, really good question. We'll um, today. Uh-huh. The, we didn't give them the, these questions in advance. So <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. The uh, you know, when I was working with the juniors, and our, our juniors are 21 and under, um, one of the, the elements that I thought was critical uh, going through it and working with those kids. Now we're doing curling at, at the time, and, and that was that um what we're doing as a team is much bigger than just the sport that we're playing. You know, we're teaching life lessons. That was, that was a foundational element. and still is a foundational element of my, my approach to, uh, to coaching. So there's life lessons to be abound. Um, we have life, life lessons to the athletes we work in with today. And our athletes today would range in, in age from, well, the youngest is 20 years old, and uh, I think when we get up to the other end of the spectrum would be late, mid, mid-40s mid on, on the national team right now, and uh, uh, so so it's it's rather large, and, and, and life lessons still apply. Um, um, there's the rules that we set as a team that we enforce, and, and the life lesson, you're going to going to violate uh, a team rule, ramifications come out of that. So anyway, with, with that concept, I think looking at this whole thing with Lanny and particularly the self-image, um, I think that kind of fell into the life lessons. We're going to speak positively about what we do. So those things, I don't want to necessarily change it all that much. The, there definitely was a reason why we're doing it changed. And it moved from the life lessons to truly benefiting your ability to put a positive imprint on what you're doing to increase the probability that the positive action is going to happen, whether it be performance related or not in the future, it's going to happen again. So anyway, with, with the application, you know, I think the biggest thing, and then this is a huge change. If you want to look at what truly did change, it would be the amount of writing that the team actually does. Now this is weird, you know, writing, writing's got nothing to do with, with breaking a clay pigeon or writing has got nothing to do with, with delivering a stone down the end of the, the sheet. But, but the logging, the journaling, my weekly recaps that the team have to, have to read. When I say they have to, I'm, I guess I require it. So I guess they do have to do that. Um, the weekly recaps, you know, what'd you do well? What'd you learn? What are you going to do di- different next time? That summary, it, it's, it, that is ingrained in our team. And that's ingrained actually in this whole positive imp- imprinting. Um, so, so, you know, in, 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 maybe in summary to, to really, really answer that. How did it change? It changed greatly with, with this whole concept of, of ensuring that what we're doing on and off the ice is, is generating these positive imprints on top, performance or not performance related, and then getting that stuff on writing, making, making people actually do the journals, making people actually summarize their journals into their weekly report to me. And, and at the end of every session, whether we're on the ice or not, pull that journal out. What'd you learn? Uh, what'd you do well? What are you going to do different next time? It's got to be written. And, and you know, it's kind of funny. We had our, our we have weekly team meetings, Thursday night, seven o'clock central. We have our weekly team meetings, of which Lanny has participated in several of those. But uh, that, that team meeting last week's topic, I mean, half of it was coming back to simply the writing an effective journal. Not effective to me. I mean, I don't need to read this. I know what you guys are doing. Your journal's there's some accountability. There, there, I, I, I guess I, I would lie if I, I would say there's no accountability, fill, accountability feature of the journal. But the biggest part of the journal is what are you learning? Why you're taking time to write on a piece of paper. You could pick up and tell me on the phone what you did. You could text me in 140 characters or, or less what you did. I don't want to see that. I want to see a written report documented. What'd you do well this week? What'd you learn? What are you going to do different next time? So that you become a better athlete on the ice and you become a better person off the ice. So that is the big, big concept, really getting into the journaling, even though some of those things we've done in the past, but we're definitely doing it for a different reason. So you know who you can thank for that journal, right? 
um, well, that's obviously if Troy wrote attainment, I'm sure that this was one of his projects. Also, It was absolutely one of his projects. <laughs> it was. was I, I, Heather, I thought we were going to you. No. I thought we were going to you. No, it was absolutely. It was the first project that Troy did even before he came on board with the company he took on the challenge of creating a journal concept that could be sellable. His dad was talking about the journal, the importance of the journal, and yet we didn't have a sellable version. And Troy's like, that's that's an opportunity. Everybody needs to be keeping one. And so, yep, you can thank Troy. Yeah, and, Troy, and, 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 wonderful and, job. Yeah. And the kicker is he he didn't want it. He, really? Yeah, he thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> he, he Initially. Poo he poo-pooed the idea. He's like, Troy, they can just get a notebook and outline it. And I told him, I said, Dad, I ran the inter- I ran the uh, junior rifle club at the Army Marksmanship Unit my last three years when I was in the Army. None of those kids liked outlining it. Do I, do I have to outline it? Yeah, you have to outline it because if I go back and review it every Tuesday, I want to I want to go to a specific section and read it. I want to know where it's at. So you have to outline it, and then they're yeah. required to record it throughout the week. And if they didn't do it, there were some consequences. And <laughs> so no one wants to outline; they just want to fill in the blanks. Yes. And I said, so, and if they're going to buy a notebook, wouldn't you rather buy a mental management notebook instead of just a notebook? So he says, well, whatever. And so. And today it's our best selling product next to with winning in mind. Yeah. No, how many different colors does that binder come in for that notebook? Well, you can thank Heather, Heather for that one. She's the one that yeah, decided. Going, I said, this has got to be a Heather <laughs> contribution. She's like, you know, how many colors are in a rainbow? I want to go for all colors here. And so, so we, we've narrowed it down to, I think, what, seven? Yeah, it, well, every time we order, there's like a different version of the color available. So you got to, you know, sometimes we're we're having more colors, not necessarily because we, we wanted them, but because that's what was available. But I kind of like the teal and the pink and the purple and the royal and things like that, you know? Yeah, and, and there's not like one color that's just a dud. They they yep. all they all sell pretty well. I mean, obviously, uh, black, blue, red are, are your most common because mm-hmm. people favor those, those colors. Black's kind of the neutral color that everyone you know, likes, and then you have your people that are, you know, oh, I'm a Cardinal fan, so they want red. I'm a Cowboy fan, they want blue, that kind of thing. So you have that, but within sports and within certain areas that we work in, certain colors uh, appeal more than others. And so we, we haven't been able just to get rid of, like, purple or pink or teal because there's still a good amount of people that love those those colors. Sure. But when we first started out, that performance analysis, when it first started, was 60 bucks. It was yep. a full kit. It was it was a it was a kit that you would buy with tear off sheets, and you would put it into a storage binder. A, a storage binder, and it was a great concept. But then yep. people would lose their sheets, right? And then it became a struggle. So we went to. Well, two things happened. One, people complained because it was it, the binder was a little bit too bulky mm-hmm. for them to put in the equipment bag. I'm, I'm sure y'all in curling, y'all have equipment bags and that kind of stuff. So. Any anything that adds more weight is just not helpful. Anything that adds more bulk, not helpful. So I don't want it. We work with a lot of golfers, and they're like, "Look, I just want to put in my bag. So the thinner, the better. The lighter, the better." And so ultimately, we over the years went to more of a quote traditional journal looking thing. We mm-hmm. still have a lot of people that they love the storage idea concept. I and mean, my view was, you write in the sheet, you tear it out, you put it in your storage binder, and you're good to go. And then now people are just like, no, nah, I just have different, you know, a row. You know, imagine your bookshelf behind you has got just a row of different PAs. Wouldn't it be nice to go, hey, there's 1990. I'm going to pick that up and look through it. So people can go back and relive information. And there's a lot more to that performance analysis than just what we're talking about with imprinting. You know, if you want to get over a slump, the fastest way to get over a slump is to go back and review the sections of what you were doing well when you were doing it. I bet you you'll find habits and attitudes that you don't possess today that you Good had boy. in the past. Well, if you don't write them down, how, how do you know this? You, you don't. So, so yeah, that was a, a nice little fun journey my first year working with the, the company. It was so cool. It was so Same. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Our, yeah, our guys still use them. Some keep it in a notebook now, but but those that started with uh, with the journal, our team Skip, he still buys his red journal and has me pick him up one when I – when I when he needs it, it's yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, I mean it's not our biggest profit margin, that's for sure. It's amazing how to get what we want with the the cover that we want it. We have mm-hmm. we we're forced to go 
overseas. And so we're, you know, that's just another expense that you, you have with shipping and that kind of stuff. And then we wind up ordering a bunch of them and it fills up the storage facility, which I think is great Sorry. because every week you just start, you see cases moving mm-hmm. every week. So yeah, who would have thought some little thing that dad made us do when we were younger? I mean, if you wanted to shoot, you had to keep a journal. That's why Heather didn't shoot. That is not why she, I she didn't Because she obviously shoot. didn't want to write in that journal. That is, that is not why I didn't shoot. That's how I understand I have it. lots of other reasons why. <laughs> that was the main reason I heard. And that, you know, I had no idea y'all were doing journals. I didn't even know what y'all did up there. I just knew I didn't want any part of it because there weren't horses there and you couldn't talk up there. And you had to be quiet. And I, I don't do well being quiet, apparently. Yeah. And, and the equipment was very heavy, and I'm, and I'm not. And I just, the idea of having to carry all that equipment, mm-mm, mm-mm. You know, but you're, you're talking about, <laughs> you know, segueing back to, to Rusty, you were, you were talking about having a, a new team, up-and-coming yeah. team. By, yeah. by in, implementing something like this, and everyone on the team knows that everyone's riding and their performances and focusing on what did I learn, what am I going to do about it, so therefore, if I want to go talk to the coaches, I, I, I don't have to go off of memory. It's right here because I'm sure mm-hmm. there's periods of the year that you're not actively with the team, you know, so yep. you might have to correspond them, you know, remotely. So here it's like how, how hard is it to take a snapshot, send it to coach? Coach can just look at it and go, oh, yeah, they're on the right track without yep. having those long phone calls and that kind of stuff. So it really helps not only accountability, but it helps you mm-hmm. probably see how everyone's doing when you're not all together training, because certainly not, you know, I, I think people have this idea that, oh, we're at the Olympic Training Center 24-7, you know, throughout the whole year. It, it doesn't work that way. You, you have, you know, ends and flows kind of thing where they come, come together for an extensive period of time, and then there's nobody for a while, mm-hmm. and then you have a, a couple that come and go and that kind of stuff. So that's got to be helpful just from organization on your part. Yeah. It, it's huge, you know, and you hit the, the whole training concept, uh, you know, from us on a, a training calendar, uh, we have, we'll generally take like an April or May or May to June off. That would be considered the, either the end of the last season or it would be the very, very beginning of the new season. Uh, somewhere between April and June, we'll select our new team. Generally have people returning. Right now, it's it's everybody returns from the prior year's team. Um, they, they simply are at a level that they're not going to get picked off at, at the trials. Um, then after that, just start your monthly camps. I mean, you're looking at, uh, yeah, you'll have a three-day to five-day camp in July, August, September, October. Uh, you start looking at, a, at competitions uh, going into the October, uh, and then continue that schedule up through the World Championship or a Paralympics that happens every four years. World Championships every year, which would be, generally, it looks like most of them in March now, it used to be February, so February and March. And then uh, the other training that we do is uh, they've got their personal training. So that's all the team training. They've got their personal training. Uh, we've got weekly meetings that happen Thursday night. And then truly Thursday night, uh, almost um, 52 weeks a year, Thursday night, at seven o'clock, we have online meetings, which we do a curling simulation as well as discussions, administration, whatever it happens to be. Um, and then we have our Sunday night report, which kind of ties everything together, which except for those two months, that, that Sunday night report ties everything together that they physically had done, have done, the game related that they did or did not do, the, uh, the mental training that they did throughout the week, and then the, uh, the, the concept of the strategy portion of the game. So there's a video that'll cover for that. Uh, there's so much that can be done off the ice that, yeah, we can train 10 months a year, even though most people only have training, uh, actually have ice available about six months a year. It's just starting to come into play. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, so yeah, that, that something that can keep everything documented, um, is critical, uh, as, as I need to have something to look at. I always see these guys faces now, um, let's just say five days a week or five days a, a month, but 60 days a year. And that, that's, you go back two quads ago. So you go back even one quad ago, you're probably down at 25 to 30 days a year. Prior to that, it was probably closer to 15. So that's, that's the difference that as the sport has changed, um, the requirement of the, that our athletes has had to change with it. But yeah, still, all those days we're not together, 
document it. Tell me what you're doing. So is it fair uh, to say the journal's your favorite product or do you have another favorite mental management product besides the journal and with winning in mind? Well, I got to say, you know, of, of the products you got, it, it truly, the, the journaling, I, I, I really love that. I, I really do. The athletes may not, but uh, um, one of them's now, this is a good one to discuss. I mean, and, and we'll have to talk to you. One of them now is, is just sending pictures of her pages, which I think we, I have to, she just started here a couple of weeks ago. And I think we've got to maybe go back and look at that because I think she's missing to tie it all together. What did you learn? Okay, these are your, your actual journals from each practice that you did or each day that you completed. But that tie in, what did you learn? What are you taking away from this week that's going to help you 25, 30, 50, 100 weeks down the road? That piece is missing. So I think we've got to go back and, and take a look at that. Granted, it saves a lot of time, but it, it's, it's not wasted time. That's probably the rehash is the most valuable. So yeah, the, the, I, I do really think that the, the, the concept of journaling is, is, is critical. The concept of the performance analysis is critical. The personal coaching session, that's the one piece, I guess I will throw that in there. Every athlete we have has, has got one hour scheduled with me uh, monthly. And that again is 10, 10, uh, 10 months a year. <clears throat> now, whether we use the whole hour or not, um, is is sometimes um doesn't happen but I, I reserve an hour a month for each one of my athletes on a schedule and we sit back and we know is when we cover everything that's happened what do we see what do i see as their strengths or weaknesses areas they need to concentrate on what questions they have for me for personal improvement changes in the game changes or clarifications from the, the prior night's meetings or strategies or whatever it happens to be so that that i think that is probably as important um that's something i did not do prior to any, prior to uh, uh, working with the mental management side and with winning in mind. But the personal coaching session, we reserving that time and actually meeting with each individual athlete, what I think was a game changer. If you want to be on the curling team and Rusty's in charge, you're going to have to be self-accountable. <laughs> so <if> there, <laughs> There's some accountability, so you bet. Right, right quick, before, before we, we end this uh, session here, how, how much is curling growing as a sport in this country? And where do you see it moving forward, you know, as a whole, curling as a whole, not just in the, in the para, but also in the, the um, able body? How, how do you see that moving forward in the future? Is this a growing sport? Is it something that is, yeah, we're, just, we're in America, Troy. It's just not going to grow. Because I'm, I'm sure most people like me, they're probably like curling. People do that? You know, that kind of thing. So so where do, where do we see it in the uh, – in the U.S. because I've actually been guilty of watching curling in the last two Olympics. I think you have probably more to do with that than anything else. And, and we've had some success in the Olympic Games, right? So it's not like we're, we're not competitive, but where is it going in this country? Are, are we growing? How, how is it looking in the forecast? And I'm going to reword that just a little bit. What's happened over the last eight years due to the Olympics? And uh, maybe we could even carry it back to the last 12 years. But curling used to be this little obscure sport that you played up in the upper Midwest, Minnesota, uh, little, well, North Dakota, um, Wisconsin, obviously, a little bit in Illinois, a little bit over in Detroit or in Michigan, and then out east. So it was this obscure little sport that, yeah, some other clubs throughout the country, I don't want to short them, but, but you had two strongholds, the Northeast and Wisconsin, Minnesota. Well, I tell you what, when this thing hit the Olympics, um, it went absolute gangbusters. The, the events that were being held by the curling centers uh, to have learn to curl events or having uh, events tied into Olympic viewing parties. I mean, it was standing room only and I truly mean that. Uh, then that has rolled out to, to curling falling into to, to areas where it doesn't even exist. There's curling right in Dallas. Um, uh, uh, the, we're, tra we're going to travel uh, to Beijing here shortly and we're flying out of LA and we'll be training at the brand new LA, uh, I'm going to call it the LA Curling Club. And that's not the name of it, but the Curling Club in, in LA, brand spanking new. Phoenix, um, uh, I said Dallas, uh, Jacksonville, Florida. All but, these hot places. Oh, uh, well, that's it. <laughs> what you've seen is the same thing that happened to hockey 20 years ago. This movement of the northern tier states in, in the United States and, and Canada and this push south where, frankly, all the people live in the winter. And that, and they've taken this game uh, with them. 
uh, due to the, the, the popularity that was generated by the Olympic telecasts, and it's pushed into all of these new strong, uh, strongholds, and uh, the growth is, is absolutely phenomenal. And that's been a growth that's been going now for the 12 year, last 12 years or so, and just continues uh, into areas that are, are, they're not cold areas, they're hot areas, they're not curling strongholds in the past, uh, but, but either the people of the sport have, have reached them and they wanna play it. So it's, the growth is absolutely phenomenal. So the next um, time you come to Dallas, you're gonna take Troy and I out curling and you're gonna teach us. Right. We can do that. We can, we, we can take you on out there. I tell you what. We'd and, have to and, film it, Troy. I, I think yeah. it would be fun. Yeah, I'm sure people get it. They'll get a real kick of that. Probably so. Oh, it is a blast. Yeah. Let, is let's, a watch, let's watch Heather and Troy fall on their butt. Mm -hmm. There we go. I'm excited about it. Yeah. All yeah, right. I'm up for it. We'll do yeah, it. Yeah, that sounds good. We've got, um, there's some neat stuff coming online here very, very soon. I can, uh, I get you into the fact when that becomes public, but there'll be some, some, some really neat stuff coming on here within the next seven to 10 days that, that are not releasable yet, but would be really, really neat. I'm not exactly sure when this podcast uh, actually goes via or goes on and be, becomes published, but I'll get you that information. You'll see some of our folks. Nice. Cool. Nice. Awesome. Well, last thing, best advice you've ever been given. Best advice I've ever been given. Um, boy, boy, you know, you're supposed to put some of these questions on a piece of paper and <laughs> slide there. And, That's just not uh, fun. That's just, you not know, fun. yeah, I would say performance related. Um, well, one of them, I'm going to say lifetime related. God's the real thing. I'll leave that right there. Um, but, but that's great advice from my wife, my family, my, it's just the way we've grown up. But number two, I, I would say that, uh, um, related to where we're talking about here is establish your goals, establish your dreams, set your standards. You, anyone, anyone can do what they want to do. Now, I'll quantify that a little bit, but I mean, I probably not going to be a, a world-class Olympic level 100 meter sprinter, mm -hmm. but boy, I can still go out and run the 100 meter and become faster every day. Um, so set, set your goals, have aspirations. Uh, um, years and years and years ago, and this I think was from Lanny, um, was, was that, that Harvard study that he's referenced before about the Harvard, brilliant people coming out of Harvard, but, but those that truly had written goals coming out, of, coming out of Harvard classes, they did their peer evaluations through their life. That, what, what did he say that 95% that, uh, of the wealth associated in the success associated with that class was to the 5% who had goals, written goals. So establish your goals, have your dreams, have your aspirations, and you're gonna do great things. You're, you're gonna do great things. If you don't have a goal, you still might, but how do you know if it's truly happening and how are you progressing? So set your goals. Dad always yeah. told me, he said, if you have a goal and you're focused on it, you will see the doors and windows of opportunity open for you. If you do not have a goal and you're not focused on it, you will not see your doors or opportunities. Yeah, yeah. and you're probably, it's your goals that are open those opportunities. It's, it's mm -hmm. probably more what you're doing. Definitely not what somebody else is doing for you. It's what you having that goal set the stage for that to happen. Because you're paying attention to the opportunities that are already uh, present. You won't you, notice them if you don't have a goal in the first place. It's been so fun talking to you today, Rusty. We want to thank you so much for being a certified coach, for being such an inspiration to us. When you come on our coaches' meetings, you always have really great questions for Dad. And, um, and you know, he's not prepared for those either, so we're kind of like payback. And um, we would just want to thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us and to spend time with us. Thanks, Troy, for being such a great partner on this podcast. I enjoy every minute. Again, like our channel, subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you next time.